here in Paris, you know, the Parisians, are, they're wonderful people, but they don't care about this. Uh, you know, look, no one's paying any attention to this passion that's going on on the bench. So, uh, but, but that's what life is like in great communities. There's a lot of passion and a lot of comfort and a lot of openness. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about tools that are uh, about placemaking, about the process, about the community is the expert, power of 10, and then lighter, quicker, cheaper, just quickly because uh, placemaking uh, is, again, when you focus on a place, you do everything differently. Uh, and so what is placemaking? Placemaking is a dynamic human function, an act of liberation, of staking claim, beautification, and is true human empowerment, broad human empowerment. It's empowering to children, to seniors, to adults of all ages, to all cultures. We've worked in every kind of community. We have a major program with the UN Habitat now that we're, we're starting and we'll be working in all these third world uh, communities, uh, in favelas and st stuff like that, doing this kind of stuff. Uh, it's also turning a neighborhood, town, or city from a place you can't wait to get through to one you never want to leave. And that's certainly the case here. I don't, I don't think anyone's ever left here, has they? Have they? <laughs> So a good place is about comfort and image, uses and activities, access and linkage and sociability. And so when you think about the waterfront and say one of your parks and the, the, the main intersection out here, uh, you look at it, the, the internal darker green are the intuitive uh, qualities. And that's what we're, we're always, we make judgments based on intuition. We make decisions on intuition. So we decide to go someplace because it feels good to be in that place. Uh, and then you can quantify it and you can measure it and it all adds up. This is extremely quantifiable uh, and it's extremely accurate uh, in terms of all the research we've done. And so, but the benefits are amazing, uh, that it, it uh, fosters interaction, improves safety and security, uh, nurtures a sense of community, uh, builds local economies, uh, it draws a diverse population and enhances accessibility for all. All of those qualities are kind of goals that a community should have, and if you set those out, placemaking is the one that helps to deliver that. So this is the place game, the place audit, and uh, what it is is we ask people uh, in terms of comfort and image, access and linkage, activities and uses, and sociability, and each of those is then given a, a ranking, so you can rank it from, from bad to good or whatever, the, whatever it says up there. And that gives you your structure, it provides a structure. You don't, you don't evaluate a whole place, you evaluate parts of places. And then that gives you this uh, really deep understanding of that particular part of that place. Then you hear other people say that pla the, the other part. So you might do three or four, you might do four, inter four corners out here at your main intersection and evaluate it in groups of four and you would each come up with an assessment of that. <coughs> you would also come up with short-term recommendations and long-term recommendations, and you'd ask someone in that place. So within three hours, we could take this group and we could go to the 10 most important places in your community and do an assessment, come back here, and, and have a whole improvement plan for this whole community based on what you think. Not what I think, but what you think. You would be able to do that. So, what this placemaking does, it, it, it empowers communities, attracts partners, uh, professionals become resources. So instead of these silos that we're operating up against, the traffic engineer who thinks he's got to move more traffic through that intersection, uh, we, we, we change that whole perception so that there are resources to help a community define its outcome. And then uh, the, uh, the design supports uses, solutions are flexible, engagement and commitment grow. And the process is you, you uh, define the place, you identify the stakeholders, you do a place plan, and then, uh, then you do short-term improvements, so lighter, quicker, cheaper, and you start to change your community around that. And so then the power of 10, this is another big idea. If you think about Main Street and you say, well, where are the 10 destinations on Main Street and how can we enhance those and pull those out? And I'll show you how that will work. Uh, and that each destination has 10 things to do. So it's a kind of goal. You're trying to set the stage for what can happen in each of those places. And each place out there, as wonderful as it is, there are more things you can do. And I'll show you some of the things that you might be able to do. So the storefront in Brooklyn, where we live in our neighborhood, 
has at least a dozen things to do at that storefront. And you can take this to a park that we worked on in Houston called Discovery Green, which has become the main destination in downtown, and we did the same thing there. And you can do this, and I'm going to show you this town in just a second, but this is a small town in northern New Hampshire, about the size of, uh, of your town here, and there are places there, and the, the, the brownish color are the parking spaces that they have, and you'll, you'll we'll come back to that. And uh, these are the, I'll, I'll come back to that. So I just want to talk about waterfronts for a little bit. Uh, uh, the qualities of a great waterfront, uh, and think of Harbor Springs as, as we go through this, sort of access and linkage, uh, the edge uses, the attractions and destinations, uh, the identity and image, amenities, uh, the water uses, uh, flexibility and design, uh, uh, can't read that. seasonal, uh, seasonal uh, strategies, place management, uh, and diverse funding sources, and then it reaches out like an octopus. So those are the qualities. I'm going to show some images for each of those. So edge uses, uh, having strong edge uses on the water, and that's one of your weaknesses, is you have, there's too much distance between the near buildings and the, and the waterfront, or there's too much parking between the waterfront and the edge uses. So you've got a combination of those things. Uh, and uh, then the whole idea of being on the water, this is in Stockholm, and Stockholm is the best waterfront city in the world, and what they do is they get as much as they can on the water. It's not just looking at the water, it's being on the water. So they will have these restaurants that are literally floating out, or, or, and this is, a, this is the Baltic Sea, so there, there is a tide there, not much of one. Uh, and so people are on the water and they want to be out there. Those restaurants do better than the ones that are back in land. So, uh, and then the attractions and destinations, uh, that little box on the bottom right is a, uh, is a, a restaurant. <laughs> uh, it's actually made out of, uh, it's floating with these uh, old soda bottles underneath it. And then there's a local restaurant that delivers your meal right to that little house and you have this wonderful place on the water that you're eating. So that's the most water-focused place I've ever seen. I didn't get to eat there. But you can see how people are kind of stretching the envelope, getting closer and closer to being more and more on the water. And that's what you need. You need to do that. Uh, and then the whole idea of identity and image. Now, I don't think you need that on the right, but if you had it here for a week, uh, the, the whole world would know about you <laughs> because those, that's in Stockholm. And uh, you can imagine all the people sort of out over the water. I mean, it's a real thrill to be on. And uh, it does something for that city that I've never seen anywhere else. Uh, it does, it is the place where the teenagers go. You know, the teenagers are the ones that are kind of the, the least understood, the least appreciated, the least provided for. And this place called Grinnelland is all teenagers. And they're all out there screaming and yelling up on, on that and other things that go on there. And so that's a big issue. Uh, I don't see any teenagers here, do I? No, you see, I mean, that's, that's the forgotten group or the denied group, and they're a, a critical part. And watching this community, there are a lot of teenagers around, and they are actually in a pretty good setting. So it works pretty well, and it's sort of like what I grew up at. So it's not, you don't do a bad job, it's you could do more. Amenities uh, are critical, uh, and just not just uh, subtle amenities, but almost provocative amenities, like that little uh, extension along a, a boardwalk in, uh, in Italy. Uh, and then the water uses. Uh, that's uh, on Granville Island on the upper right, and uh, there's a restaurant there, and you can imagine how many families come there, and the kids go and play in the water, and the families eat. So that's a really wonderful thing, and then swimming pools, and then that. And then the flexibility of design, uh, you know, you don't have a movie theater, but you could have movies on the waterfront. Uh, and that would be wonderful. Big, there are these inflatable screens, you can put it up and you could do that next week, or, you know, in, in a very short term, and then sort of events on the waterfront. And then the whole thing about seasonal strategies, uh, you know, there's antique boat shows are big, you, you, you probably have, you have some wonderful antique boats, but, but do you know what a foamer is? Um, a foamer, only men can be foamers. Uh, it's people who work on small model railroads, 
and they stand around and look at the railroads and they foam at the mouth <laughs> because they're so excited about it. Well, it's the same thing with these antique boats. And this is in a place called Stavanger, Norway. And uh, there were just people, all these older men, hanging out, talking about their boats, and, you know, and everyone talking at the same time and being very excited about it. Uh, and then the whole idea of place management uh, that then uh, just brings more and more reasons to be there and a diverse funding base. Uh, and then access and linkage, uh, you know, every, I've heard almost at least a dozen people talking about some of these big uh, uh, ships, cruise ships or whatever, ferry boats and things that go out. Well, the great cities of the world are full of these kind of boats that get you around so that you get out on the water you don't just look at the water. And you do that nicely here, but you lost some of the old uh, boats. There used to be, what, Argentina, the USS Argentina or something used to come here. Well, you know, getting back to that as we get more and more on the water is really important. And then uh, it needs to reach out like an octopus. Uh, there's something, you have this real problem is getting from Main Street to the waterfront. It's not a, it's not a comfortable, it's more like a divide than it is a connection. Connection. So, so working on that is these again. These are subtle little things, but they have a big impact. You know, you're probably are coming down. You're probably going to the waterfront, or you're probably going to Main Street. But making that transition from one to the other is not as much as it could be. So, and and Barcelona has the best rambla that brings you down. You just naturally come down to the water and you go up. Sometimes you don't even get to the water and you go back up. But at least you're you know, there's this better connection. And so these streets that go down to the water are really critical is to make them more walkable, more pedestrian, bike friendly, and that subtly gives the message that you want to be there. So uh, start with your vision. Uh, the idea of 10 destinations, of 10 places, of 10 things to do, connect them. Public use and public outcomes should be the primary objective. Best waterfronts have complete public access all along the waterfront. You have a problem there. Uh, the, the whole idea of promenades and bike lanes serve the best waterfronts, and the best waterfronts have limited roads along them and good edge uses. So that's a vision that if you can build up that vision and start to mitigate that through some, especially some of the private properties that are, are not permitting access. Now, there's, there are ways you can do it, I think, and, and I've looked at a number of them, and I think there's some ways to do it. So now, let's go to your Main Street. You have a really special Main Street. Uh, there are so many special stores on it, so many special people. I had breakfast with Mary Ellen this morning, and uh, I want everything she has. I want her to change her menu, uh, because her menu, there's so many good things on it, that if she did one of those, you know when you go to a fancy restaurant, they give you a tasting menu? Well, I got a tasting menu, which was just wonderful. But they, what is that, what are those potato things? Stuffed ham bra hash browns. They're, those are the best I've ever had, without any, any doubt anywhere. Uh, so uh, I don't mean to be advertising, but uh, <laughs> when you find something good, you got to. And, and then we started talking about, uh, you know, some of, I don't know if you think, I, I would love to see a, a dog park. But then next to the dog park should be a little, uh, a little store that she has that she can bring out, a little kiosk, so that you can get these, uh, stuffed hash browns, uh, and then uh, there needs to be a playground, and then a little ice cream stand, and you've got, you're in heaven right there. You know, dogs attract kids, and you know, that's triangulation, and it needs to be in a good place, uh, so that that's one of your attractions. And I don't mean to be pushing an idea, but uh, I've seen that work so beautifully in so many places. So when you design your community around cars, you'll get more cars. Uh, when you design your community around people, you'll get more people. So if you shift the focus to people, it can change the whole way that Main Street functions, and it can be beautiful. Uh, our clients are these kind of people, the kids that want to be in town, but they can't because it's so hostile or it's unsafe. Uh, this is a big deal. When I grew up, I could bike anywhere. I had a newspaper route. I had 117 newspapers that I delivered every day. I had the whole town. I grew up in Andover, Massachusetts. And I had the whole town. And with my friends, we had, could go anywhere. That's what you can do here. But there are barriers at the same time uh, for any age. 
coming onto Main Street. It's a little hostile, not that comfortable. Uh, so getting into, this is in, uh, outside of Copenhagen, where they redesigned the Main Street, and it's one of the most social places. I've never seen a gathering of 10 uh, mothers with baby carriages, and I saw it here. That was sort of a record. Uh, it's in our neighborhood, it almost happens. We have the highest number of three-year-olds in any, in any zip code in New York, uh, in our neighborhood. So now, Littleton, New Hampshire. This is a town a lot like you. Uh, it's, uh, it's not as much a, a summer town. It's a year-round town. And it's one of those amazing settings. It's, it's very big for the 10,000 people that live there, 7,000 people. Uh, and they want to go from adequate to extraordinary, OK? Uh, they uh, they want to eat in diners. They want to ride trains. They want a porch on the house. They want to shop on Main Street. And they want to live in a walkable community. Uh, great goals. And they can do that. So this is their Main Street. And that's this, they call that the opera house on the left in the back uh, because it's not just the town hall, but it's also the community uh, neighborhood performance center as well. It does both. It serves multiple uses. And uh, the building on the left is the post office and the courthouse. There's a very funny story about that. Uh, it was the drawings for this were sent to Littleton, New Hampshire, but they should have been sent to Littleton, Massachusetts. But they got the drawings and they liked it, so they built it in Littleton, New Hampshire. <laughs> And, then, and so this is the town. They're almost all owner-occupied stores. It's a wonderful place. They have a wonderful bookstore. Uh, there's seating outside. People take great care of it. They have their own movie theater. You know, if I were a zillionaire and I lived here, I would build a movie theater somewhere in town and so that people could come to the movies and not, the, not have these, you know, not have to go somewhere else. You should be able to go to a movie here and then what that does for everyone else. But that's owned locally. And there's that picture. Now remember, those are dots are the destinations that people have in that town, like you. You could put your dots all along this, uh, the main street here, and then the parking is in those areas. Uh, and there's almost, uh, no one is ever in any of that parking because people want to park in front of the store they're going to. And so what's happened is that that town has shrunk so that it's in those orange zones right there. And people drive to that orange zone and then complain about parking uh, because that's the, only, that's the, the town has shrunk so much that it's just in those two places. So you have all these people trying to go to, to, to two very specific places. And, uh, and if we can connect those, uh, and then we can go beyond that and we can open, there's a water, there's a river right there uh, on the, the white, sort of r r r uh, rapid type stuff. And we can actually get the town to be what, is like, what it was like in the 1930s, uh, when people did not drive, where they did walk, and where the whole town, they went and did four or five errands on, in town instead of driving to one place doing something and then driving to another place. So this is, and so we did this exercise that you're seeing that, that I showed you before. and. Uh, so people evaluated the post office. And what they wanted was a place to open their mail, to hitch up their dog, uh, and to have some coffee in front of the post office. Great idea. Uh, and then this woman gives out information to everyone, even if they don't want it. She gives <laughs> out information. Well, you know, she has to have other things to do. So if she did a few other things, then she wouldn't pester people, but then they would appreciate her and come and sit with her, and she'd still give out information. But, uh, and that's the community center where they have the cultural activities in there. And then this is the library, and uh, this is a wonderful building, and people come there, but what happens is you see that wall in the front? That's where the teenagers sit. And that's where the seniors are uncomfortable about going to the library because the teenagers are sitting there. Okay, uh, now those are three of the teenagers right there. They're not that dangerous, but uh, but that's I mean these are subtle little things that go on in a special community. I mean th this is not you know this is not rocket science. This really happens everywhere, and that building only had uh, had one entrance for four stores, so it had no presence on the street. You see, 
And this is where people would buy cigarettes. A lot of people smoke up in northern New Hampshire. And that's where the presidential candidates stay when they go there for the presidential thing. So here's, just the, here's this little stretch of a street, okay? And uh, we were actually working with the New Hampshire Department of Transportation. And we had all the senior staff at the New Hampshire DOT doing this evaluation with the community. And the head of the New Hampshire DOT lived in this town. So she was as much interested in making that town work. And all of these engineers were just as good a people as you could ever find, and they wanted to make the town work too. So this was one of those watershed moments where the whole idea of the town working as a series of places, as a destination, was, the, was paramount to, this, to the New Hampshire DOT. We worked in five other communities, changed the whole way DOTs function in that state. So here is that, and putting in back in angle parking uh, is safer, research shows. In front, of the, uh, in front of the post office, uh, a place to hitch, your, uh, hitch up your dog, uh, have coffee, and then a crosswalk over to a little park across the street where there's an ice cream parlor, okay? So that was how, it, we didn't locate it at the intersection, we located it where people wanted to go. Uh, and then going down, that, see where the, the information thing is, we created a garden and a tea house, and then uh, opened up the, uh, the storefronts, and then the post office, people wanted to bring the, the entranceway down to the street, and then there's a crosswalk to a bookstore across the street. And so the street was designed so that each use was reinforced. So it's not streetscape design, it's, it's focusing on what we call streets as a place. So the places along the street become what you build out and you, you showcase so that people come there. Now you could do that here. Uh, there's one place where you have deliveries and you could just bulge out that and there's some, there's some uh, food service right there. There's, a, there's a, a, I guess, a very important coffee shop. Well, you could have people sitting on the street. Well, then people will attract people will attract people. You hide people behind cars on a street. So there are, are areas where you could take away that parking, maybe lose six parking places or seven but that would bring people out into that space, they'd be more visible, and that would give more presence of people on the street. So when you get a building like that, it kills that whole street. And what happens there is if we can improve that building uh, and connect it, we will have then made the downtown feel bigger. And then if we can go and take, here what happened at this intersection, the DOT had taken the crosswalk out so you couldn't cross. Uh, you had to go way around to get across the street. And that didn't bode well, and that kind of nibbled at that part of town. Uh, and so by moving the city hall back, because it needed to be moved, because the foundation was eroding, uh, you could create a whole destination at this end of town, and, uh, and then uh, do something like that. And then the bridge going over the river was just one of these off-the-rack bridges that had no personality, and you could open that up, uh, and then uh, do something like that, put parking on it, and then bring people down to the river there, and then create an entranceway to the town. Uh, and then the most interesting thing of all, they're all, was, this was all interesting, because we were dealing with people in that community. So here uh, was a bank, uh, and the bank uh, president and the, the couple that owned the ice cream store next door to each other, we were standing here on the street, and we asked them, well, uh, why do you have this wall between your two businesses? And none of them knew the answer. So if you take the, biz the wall down and you open it up, you can go and get ice cream and go to the bank and go to the bank and get ice cream. So all of a sudden you've created a synergy that is, just makes so much sense. Uh, and so then by, uh, by going back and by connecting all of these, uh, you've actually brought the town back to what it was like in the 1930s. Uh, where people were walking and they didn't drive very much and they would go to four or five different stores and the town was whole, you can get it back to that and you can actually make it much better. So the message for here is you have that same possibility here, sort of extending the town, enlivening, activating different parts of the main street, the main intersection out here where the old Shell station was, uh, that people need to come closer to the corner, there needs to be more going on. The front of this building is uh, more like a suburban building, as nice as this building is. 
It needs to be uses going on. Uh, and maybe little squares and places for people to sit in front of this so that it, and maybe a, a vendor or two that goes down to where the park is because the park is right there. So this, as nice as this is, it's a beautiful look at me building, but the outside is, you know, it's nice to look at. So it's a very different, you see where we're going is you're turning things upside down to get things right side up. It's very different, but it's what you want too. It's intuitively what you want. This is not rocket science. It's not a radical departure. It's sort of growing intuitively what will make your community a lot better. So now let me go into a big transformation. The whole idea of what we call shared streets or shared space. This fellow is a traffic engineer. He looks like a traffic engineer. <laughs> uh, and he is a traffic engineer. And he was the most he had such a strong orientation towards statistics and accident data and stuff like that. But he all of a sudden started to realize that having an intersection like this was not an asset for the communities he was serving in Northern Holland. Was not an asset for the communities he was serving in Northern Holland. So what he did, uh, and that does nothing for any of that. The, those, the, those corners, they recede back in. The people don't go there. There's nothing pleasant about it. It's all about traffic. 37,000 vehicles a day were going through that intersection. So what he did is he did this. He turned it into that. He took all the signs out. There are no stop signs. There are no lights. Uh, you come into this section, this place, and, uh, and you slow down, and you get to where you're negotiating, creating eye contact with a pedestrian or a bicyclist. So what you've done is he's using sociability as the way of determining how you use that intersection. Big deal, really, really big deal. So uh, it looks like that. So these people and these bikes, you need a lot of these bikes here uh, because you don't ever have to get in a car when you come here uh, and you probably should never. I, I, we have a place in Delray Beach and once we get there, we never use our car anymore. We just ride our bikes and have things that we can go get all our food and everything. Uh, but they negotiate. And so there's this, in fact, we were standing there with this guy, Hans Monderman, and a bus came along and the, the bus driver opened up the door and he said, thank you, Mr. Monderman, you have made my life much better. Well, this is what's so interesting. When you look at the accident data, the actual crashes, before there was an average of about 10 a year at that intersection, and after it went down to about one a year, okay? Now, it is even more interesting. So he says, if you want vehicles to behave like they're in a village, build a village. Uh, and then essentially what it means is a transfer of power and responsibility from the state to the individual in the community. That's the paradigm shift. So you're now taking responsibility for negotiating with people coming into your town. Now you can build a street that will perform that way and get closer to that, maybe not as much as that, but you can change the whole paradigm by how you, the, the street widths, the sidewalk widths, uh, having more people on that street, and you can make it into a great, great street, not just a, a great street. So uh, we lead this all over the country. We're training people every part of the country on this. Uh, we run the Federal Highway Administration Context Sensitive Solutions website, so we know a lot about this. The guy there in the white shirt uh, used to be head of scope development and planning for the state of New Jersey. He destroyed more communities in New Jersey than anyone else ever could do. And about towards the, the last five years of his career, he said, I'm not doing any good here. So he hired us to train all the state DOT people in that state on placemaking and how to make good, good communities. He's now leading our effort nationally. And uh, this is one of those shared spaces. And, uh, there are no stop signs, and so guess what? Uh, he goes out and stands with this other fellow in the middle of the street, middle of the street, okay? And, uh, and he stands there, and they just have this casual conversation like you would at a street corner, and you know, a truck comes along, and it goes through, a car comes in, a bicyclist comes there, no one even says anything. They don't honk, it's all part, they're, 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 it's where they can be. They can be anywhere in that space, and the vehicles go by. There's 17,000 vehicles go through that intersection every day. So, uh, and here he is. So then we decide, well, let's put a chair out <laughs> in the middle of the intersection. And, uh, and he's, he's, he's a different person now. 
he totally is, he's totally changed his whole thing and he's one of the most powerful DOT people in the country and he's working all across, uh, he's in, he's in uh, Texas today. So, and then, uh, I'd love to show you this, but it's, there's a video of this. But these are three roundabouts in, in the center of a city in, in Norway, Stavanger. And it's just amazing to watch how they work uh, and how the pedestrian interaction, it's the same, uh, same uh, uh, idea as the shared space. And so that works in that community beautifully. And there's far more traffic going through here than anything you have here. So, and then I want to talk about corners, just a few, a few images. Uh, corners are critical. You have one great corner on this side of the street down here. It's a, it's a cutback corner. It really has a strong presence. If you have, as you come into town, there's a, a dentist's office who I guess is maybe retiring. If that became a good corner and the, the empty lot across the way, if that plan was kind of uh, shaped a little bit, it's not a good Main Street plan, uh, that you could actually have this amazing presence that where you would slow down. You need to narrow the road a little bit, put up lines of parking in front of the, uh, the historical center so that you think, you know, and then put a car there all the time, maybe a police car. Um, and then that'll just change the whole perception as you come into town and there you are, you've arrived, but you need to arrive. And then you slow down and you start looking and then you start negotiating with people and then you've become a place. Uh, you're not there, you're sort of, you're kind of pushing the envelope the other way. And so these are little things that really add up, subtle things. Uh, and so like these uh, corners in, uh, on Atlantic Avenue, Delray Beach, uh, you, you can't drive on Atlantic Avenue. You walk your car on Atlantic Avenue. You don't drive it. And it's an experience. And so you want to be there. And this is how a building was changed. The top is what it used to be like. And they made a corner out of it. And they gave it a little bit of an elevation. And then because the side street was important, they, they did, they, whoops, I guess I took that out. Anyway, they, they actually made the side street part of the, the main street experience. So you, you, you naturally go down the side street and you have some great side streets and you've got to get people around and moving back and forth the side streets and down to the waterfront and then back, back a block. So, and then these are in Argentina and uh, these uh, really are amazing. It's sort of like creating a square at the intersection, okay? Even though the street is still there, the, the, uh, the, the sidewalks on, on all four corners are like part of a square changes the whole perception. So that's a, that's a, you know, that's a not a little deal, whoops, sorry. And then uh, in special places you take out the parking so that you can see people and then that, those little things, you've got to keep the street as a street and, and cars, but you change the perception of the street so that it's like you're, you're walking your car, you're walking in, as a pedestrian and you're riding a bike and they all work together to help to activate that place. Not to destroy it or not to negate it, but to make it feel the, like the kind of place you want. So it's fine tuning that is, is subtle, but it's powerful, the impact that it can have. So I'm gonna close by talking about some principles. We found long ago that the community was the expert. Uh, people in a community see a community in a holistic way. They don't see it through the silos that disciplines have. Uh, if you're a child, you make decisions on where you go. If you're a parent, you make decisions on where your child can go. If you're a senior person, all of these are done on broad thinking about how you feel about a place and where you want to go. Uh, and that you're creating a place, not just a design. A design is, 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 is very different than, the, than creating a place. And that you, you can't do it alone. The 7,000 volunteers in Balboa Park are a powerful source of energy and change that can facilitate improvements around creating place. Uh, and there are always people that say it can't be done. Yogi Berra said if they say it can't be done, it does not always work out that way. <laughs> okay, if they say it can't be done, it does not always work out that way. And that's been our motto because everything we do is turning everything upside down to get it right side up. You know, it's not fun to do that, but if you have to do that, because the community is far more important than some traffic engineer trying to put more traffic down your community and work to destroy it, that's not a positive thing. Uh, so, and then you can see a lot by observing. You can have a, develop a placemaking vision, which we talked about, the power of 10, triangulation. Form supports function, uh, 
got to know what the, tomorrow, we have a, a 500 ideas of what the program for this new square at Harvard can become. And we have to turn it into management plan and some design for that. That's what's really, it's a challenge and that's what's really fun. Uh, and then the lighter, quicker, cheaper. We used to say start with the petunias. Uh, what's that town that does petunias? Charlie. Uh, right. Well, you don't, you've got you to start with uh, lighter, cheaper, cheaper, quicker and, and build a place. You, and you'll put some flowers in too. And then uh, money is not the issue. Uh, and never has money been an issue for any of the places we have ever worked because what you're coming up with is something that everyone wants and therefore money, you know, it's always easy to get or it's not so expensive. So we've never had a problem with money anywhere we have ever worked. Uh, and then you're never finished. So, and this goes into it with some images. I don't need to go into those now, but uh, uh, there's also this kind of convergence that's going on. Uh, Placemaking has become, uh, it's, become, it's amazing how people who are interested in sustainability realize that placemaking is their way of creating a sustainable future. Placemaking is an action, it's an activity. The outcome is something that's sustainable. Uh, it's about local food systems and local markets. I didn't talk that much about it, but the more a community comes together, the more local it is, the more local the foods are, the more local the businesses are. Uh, the whole thing about preservation and historic preservation, we worked a lot with the National Main Street Center and with the National Trust for Historic Preservation. Uh, it's been fascinating because what they instead of just preserving buildings, you create places where the buildings are part of that place. And so you're animating and activating historic areas so that they're more sustainable financially. And then uh, local economies, uh, the whole thing about public health, we are working more and more with national public health agencies uh, and in cities like we're working in Detroit and with their, the health of Kresge, uh, working on healthy communities there, doing placemaking, not visioning, but placemaking because it's an action that can happen. Uh, and the civil society and the community development and all of that seems to be more and more moving towards the whole idea of place and placemaking. And so the la next to the last slide is good places breed healthy activity. Uh, people attract people, attract people. Uh, when you focus on place, you do everything differently. Uh, it, it takes many skills and disciplines to create a place. In fact, I almost might change that. It takes 30 volunteers <laughs> or something like that. Uh, and it takes a community to create a place. Uh, there aren't many places that are as much a community as this place is. So that creating these places should be a natural uh, way of, of evolving your community. Uh, uh, the other, the, uh, you know, uh, oh, making a place comfortable or critical, it's just so obvious. Uh, and then you can't know what you're going to end up with, which is really wonderful because it releases you from having the final solution because it's going to change, I guarantee you. Uh, people change, communities change, and you just become what you become and you grow it and change as you go through time. And then uh, each place has its own identity. And uh, you can't have anything less than excellence. And this is the most important thing, the last one, is you have to have zealous nuts. And I don't think there are any zealous nuts in this room. I think uh, that I, I can't think of anyone who's a zealous nut, except for you and you and you and you and you and you and you. <laughs> Every person I've met in this community is a zealous nut. They are, you're so proud to be here and be in this place. Now your job is to, to move it beyond what it is.